Hi everyone, I'm Andrew, aka The Brassic Gamer. Welcome to my contribution for the 486 build-off. So the last two videos that I did, which was a little while ago now, um, were both build-offs. And I'm going to go back to something a bit more often ready, just so I can make a video and like share what I'm doing, which is ultimately the goal here. So like the last couple of builds, uh, I heard about the 486 build-off via Twitter, um, specifically Patrick over at OCR. And it's kind of a challenge which is quite open. It can be any 486 system, so that includes 5x86 because they're not Pentium architecture. Um, and it doesn't have to be a complete build either, just some kind of showcase for the system, including some kind of upgrade or downgrade or change in hardware, I guess. So here's a little introduction to what I'm going to be doing. So I'm actually going to be making two videos, hopefully. Um, one of them will be about this system, which is my 5x86 running at 160 megahertz. And I actually made this for the 486 Quake Race, which was also a Twitter thing. And that was really good fun. I actually ended up making a system very similar to the system, my first system that I built when I was a teenager. Um, and it actually has the same motherboard in it that I had back then. Um, and there's some other changes and I'm going to be installing a five and a quarter inch drive in there and moving it to another case, which is hiding down there. And just kind of talking about the hardware and, and the kind of games that I would play on that. And then the other video is going to be about this. ESA, which was a 32 bit bus introduced in the very late 80s, kind of 88, 89, I think, and isn't seen on a lot of systems these days. And this was previously, it's out of its case at the moment because I'm gonna be making some changes to it, was previously um, a low-end 486 gaming system that I could play because quite a few 90s games were speed sensitive certainly demos and that kind of thing. And there's stuff that will just run too fast on that. And um, you just can't appreciate it. Even with the turbo mode, there's a, there's a middle ground which you can get with the actual hardware. And that's what I did with this system. And I was playing around with this a couple of years ago now and shared quite a bit of that on Twitter. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm stripping this back and instead, I'm going to be making a server out of it, basically a 1994-95 web server um, using proper business grade components, which would have been really expensive back in the day. And I'm going to put it online and you're going to be able to visit it. So I'm going to start off by talking about the hardware itself that I'm going to be using. Um, <laughs> yeah, there is quite a bit of hardware here at the moment. Uh, I mean, two weeks ago, my desk looked quite different. It looks more like this, which was perfect, you know, just the layout that I wanted. And then the 486 build off happened. And uh, now my desk looks like this. So stuff that has come out is the Gravis Ultrasound and the Sound Blaster 16, because they're not business uh, hardware at all. Um, and what we're gonna put in is this motherboard for a start, which is by TMC, and it's the PET48PN Revision 1. And this is a board where well, the BIOS is dated 1991, but the presence of Visa Local Bus, that would suggest more like 1993. I mean, the BIOS chip itself says 92. But there are various uh, revisions and variations on this motherboard which was the core of a computer called the Swan DB, which was a server sold by Swan Technologies, uh, which amazingly the manual still exists for and has complete documentation for this system. So if we go through what we've got, um, because of the way ESA works, as opposed to ISA, although this is backwards compatible with ISA, so you can plug your standard ISA components in and they will work perfectly fine. Um, ESA is extended ISA, basically, and it provides 32 bits 
I'm not going to go into it too much because there's loads of stuff you can read if you're really bothered. But as you can see, it's got a second tier of contacts. So it's taller than ISA. Um, and also there are intermediate pins between each of where the um, ISA contact pins would be to make more addresses available. So you can actually have um, multiple cards on the same IRQ with an ESA system, for example. But also you can do bus mastering, which means that a card such as a SCSI controller can take over the bus completely and do transfers between devices on the bus, bypassing the chipset and the CPU altogether. So what else have we got here? Um, because of the way ESA works, as I was saying, you've got a special RTC here, which isn't just a normal Dallas real-time clock. It also has some NVRAM in it. Uh, which is non-volatile storage for the settings. So it was supposed to make configuration and bus conflicts um, easier to deal with. Um, so I've done the usual coin cell mod on this. So although this board booted when I got it, and I got it for free from a former workplace, they just had it in a kind of display unit and were showing it to the computer science uh, degree students. And they didn't want it anymore. So they were like, do you want it? And I said, uh, yes, please. And it came with uh, that Adaptec controller, luckily. Um, the original RTC, although the system booted, obviously it couldn't retain any settings. So I ordered a replacement. That just hung the system. Um, for some reason, that the system wouldn't boot with a flat battery or whether it was fake or whatever I never actually worked it out so I did the coin cell mod instead and that's been working fine ever since the other issue that I had with this board was that the cache was missing though this board has a weird cache setup because normally you would have one two three four five six seven eight cache chips and then you would have a tag chip as well this board can cache up to 128 meg of RAM it's got two extra cache chips and these were actually left on the board, but there is a bit of a problem because this, the CPU that I decided to use because it's a, a CPU that I've always been intrigued by and wanted to try out my own tests with is a DX50. So this was the last of the non-clock doubled CPUs they got up to a 50 megahertz front side bus and there were so many problems with it, with stability and overheating that um, they gave up on that. And um, they did clock doubling instead with 33 megahertz bus and AMD went to a 40 megahertz one for the DX280. And that had comparable, if not better performance with none of the stability problems whatsoever. But I have got some interesting discoveries about the DX50 that I'd like to share anyway. So while the DX50 is good fun, the cache actually does not work when it's enabled uh, running at 50 megahertz. I don't know if that's because the cache chips themselves are a slightly different speed to the tag chips, which are 12 milliseconds, and these are 15 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds equates to about 66 megahertz, 12 is obviously faster than that, but I just can't get it to run stably at all. So um, either I run a DX50 with no external cache, or I can chuck in this Overdrive DX266 CPU. Close down the, uh, the motherboard speed to 33 megahertz instead, and just see how that affects performance, really. There are so many things to configure on this board with uh, resistor networks and jumpers, and it's the usual 486 pain in the ass, but I've managed to get this system working quite well. Um, you've got 16 megabytes of parity RAM. So this board does support parity RAM. You can use non-parity. You have to disable it in the BIOS, otherwise the system won't post. So that is the motherboard. Next up is IO and graphics. The Swan DB was originally shipped with a, a Tseng ET4000 graphics card, and that's what this one is, although it's covered up with a label at the moment. Um, the I don't know what the model is, 
but the FCC ID is JDF TSPW 32VL01. There's a part number as well, but I mean, that doesn't bring up any results whatsoever, but it's 1993. It's got two meg of RAM on it and it runs very nicely at 50 megahertz. There are jumpers here, so you can adjust the weight state according to the bus speed and I've never got this car to run at zero weight states so I run it at one and that's fine two weight states doesn't seem to make that much of a difference now although I've got this very nice ESA SCSI card from Adaptech and this can support up to 14 devices I believe because it's got two SCSI channels plus it also has a floppy controller which is very useful it's really fast, I've tested it out, and it it beats a VLB controller actually, which you might be surprised by, because the ESA bus is actually slower than the VLB bus. I just said VLB bus. But I also have this, which I acquired from eBay some years ago and never actually got the chance to use until recently. This is the, well, it says that there, DPT PM2122, which is, on the surface of it, just a SCSI card, but it's designed to be upgraded in steps as you can afford it. So this card originally was about $500 back in 1993, and it was an upgrade to the previous model because it includes a 68,000 series CPU, but it's the 020 rather than the slower 68,000 I think that the last model had and this was quite a well supported card in enterprise operating systems which you'll see when we do the setup you've got this upgrade card which is a cash card the CM4000 and that cost $555 if you wanted to add that on and you can also add on this tiny little board, which was also $555. And that is the DM4000. And that is adds the ability to have RAID, basically, on this card. So you needed to have that in order to have this. So the whole lot together would have been well over $1,500 in 1993 and this is the card that we're going to be using to have SCSI RAID in a 486 and that's going to have our data stored on it for the web server. There is one problem with that which is that uh, the floppy interface was an option on this card at retail and that was an extra $25 I think but it's not included on this so I'm going to have to use this card as well probably um, or some other card to have the floppy interface. Haven't decided yet. But also if we're going to want um, serial for a mouse connection I'm going to need an IO card for serial as well. This is why you quickly add up uh, occupied slots in a system like this. So I have built a version of this system before a couple of years ago but I didn't document it very well and only shared a few posts on Twitter um, so I want to give it another go but the reason the original system failed was because the hard drives died the next time I turned it on I'd got alarms and beeps from the RAID card which was basically saying that, that the RAID had failed after testing the drives individually I found that uh, two of them had died so two out of three drives were dead so then I was thinking that, you know, 50 pins, SCSI drives are pretty rare. Those that are around have been thrashed in servers and stuff like that. So I was pretty down on the chances of getting it recovered without getting something like blue SCSI or some kind of uh, flash replacement. But they're quite expensive. I mean, what, 40, 50 quid for a blue SCSI if you can actually get one. So I took to eBay. And I got lucky. And the drives that are included in here are Seagate Barracudas. 
and it's, they're in great condition. This is a very clean setup. I don't know where it's been stored, but these are apparently one gigabyte drives. I'm 100% sure on that, but that's what the listing had stated. These four are 50 pin SCSI interface, although apparently, oh, sorry, apart from that one. So all these four came out of the external caddies. Um, these three are two gigabyte models, although two of them are the same. Uh, one of them is slightly different. So now I've got four, which I've tested and which work. Well, I've done a basic test. After the IDE interface is initialized, the SCSI interface initializes. It will detect the drive. And if, if at this point it detects it successfully, that's good news, basically. So the good news is that I've got three working 50 pin drives that I can use with the cable that I got, um, which can accommodate three drives and a CD-ROM. The cable itself is kind of a fun story in a way because I bought the wrong cable on eBay by accident, which had five connectors, but two of them were external. So that wasn't going to be any use to me at all. Luckily, you can just cut those off. And all you need is another cable that you can donor from or buy fresh connectors, these um, IDC ones. You just unclip them, pull off the old cable, and then put the clip back on. Then you can slide through the cable that you cut off from the wrong adapter and then you just need to crimp it somehow. Um, I used a grip vise because I don't have a bench vise. And then, Bob your uncle, you've got the cable that you want. Uh, well, the next fun game we need to play is choose the SCSI ID <laughs> because each drive on the uh, on each interface needs a different unique ID from zero to seven, I think it is. So I've got one, two or four to choose from. But that's fine because I've got three hard drives, so you know they've got one ID each, except the optical drive has the same set of IDs one, two, and four. So there's an easy way to solve this. Um, I'd already decided to use the Adaptex SCSI card for a floppy drive. Um, so I guess I'll use a separate channel on that for the optical drive and that will make things a bit easier cable management wise. Things we need before we start. Um, obviously all the drives need to be connected and powered. Um, I haven't connected the optical drive yet. Floppy drive with a boot disk, uh, just DOS 6.22. The um, DPT card is installed and is connected up to the drives. And the Adaptec card is hosting the floppy drive. And that's already configured. So I'm kind of cheating a bit because uh, that would still boot from the floppy even if it wasn't configured. So. Right, once we've got a dust prompt, we now need the ESA config utility. So that can be any ESA config utility that matches up with the BIOS for your board. Also, the ESA config disk needs to have the correct drivers on it. You've got these um, config files, and they are remarkable in that they start with an exclamation mark. So the one that says OPT and then four zeros, that is the motherboard config file. The DPT one is obviously for the, uh, the big SCSI card. And then there's the ADP one, which is for the adapter card. Those need to be on a disk or this disk so that you can load them into the RAM, basically. That's where it remembers the settings. Well, I don't know about you, but I've had enough of that hard drive noise already. Um, so here is the ESA configuration utility. Um, it's got a really useful help section if you've never used ESA before. So it explains how, and this is the, uh, the AMI one, the American Megatrends config utility, because that's the BIOS. So if you've got a different kind of BIOS, then you need a different kind of 
config utility, probably, but it's the kind of thing you're gonna have to play around with until you find something that works. So the ECU must be executed every time ISA or ESA adapt cards are physically added. Technically, you should have a config file for ISA cards as well, so that the ESA config knows which IRQs are being used, etc., etc. but you can get away with it. Um, if you do the usual stuff of making sure that you're configuring it yourself. So it's, it kind of needs you to hold its hand a bit more than ISA does. Um, if you're already good at ISA and dealing with conflicts, then ESA's not that much more tricky, to be honest. The ESA bus is much faster than the ISA bus. So it goes into a whole thing about explaining what ESA is, like you've never heard of it before, which probably most people hadn't. Next up, we've got add and remove boards. So now it's gonna scan the config files that exist on the disk just to make sure that their syntax is correct. That takes a little while. And as you can see, it's already recognized the motherboard as ESA DB revision one, and also it already recognizes the adaptic host adapter. But the DPT card is not present in the list and it should be, to be honest. What should have happened was I turned on the computer and it should say uh, configuration incorrect because it would detect that there was a new board but that there was no config file associated with it. Um, just to show you, if I go into the config for the adaptic card, you can adjust the IOQ manually and you can adjust the base address and also you can get into utilities which are based in the ROM on the card itself. So if we scroll down, got all these various options, and then you've got press enter to configure. And from here, you can change the BIOS configuration, which supports drives bigger than one gigabyte and more than two drives. I don't know if one or two drives, so that's fine. And some really insane technical details, which I have no interest in whatsoever. So we're gonna leave that alone. There's also a format utility, so you can low level format a drive if needed, but most drives are already formatted in that way, so not really needed. So that's what the config program looks like. Every time you want to add or remove a card, you're supposed to come into this and associate a config file and make sure that it's all happy and working. Then you save it and then you can reboot. I done goofed. I couldn't work out why the card wasn't being recognized and the fact that the LED was strobing was a false positive because this card is not fully inserted and this is an issue with ESA cards but I mean, visually it's obvious I should have just bloody checked. Right let's try that again. Aha that's looking better so that's the pattern you get when the card is inserted properly but isn't yet configured. And that's what you want to see is the BIOS is recognized. It's waiting, waiting, waiting. And that's perfect. The drives are recognized. There we go. That's the activity that you get when it's configured. I'm just having Night Rider flashbacks now. It's very pretty. So once the hardware is all installed and is working correctly, then you can run the DPT storage manager tools, which amazingly are still available online and you can just download them and unzip them onto a floppy disk. And that's what I'm using in this case. Um, so the first page shows you all the devices that are installed in the computer. And then you can go through each of the items and just check that all the parameters are correct before you move on to the next section. So then you get the list of operating systems supported by this card and I've never seen a list this long. In fact, there are operating systems here that I've never even heard of um, and had to look them up. I mean, Banyan Vines I've come across because you've got drivers in Windows for that. Pick some kind of database operating system, Theos, slightly overwhelming and also very, very cool. So here again, I can view the card itself and it tells me all the hardware that's installed, the array module, the cache module, and it even tells me the specific RAM that I've got installed. So there's eight meg altogether. 
So now I can switch view and that gives me logical storage units. And if I create a RAID group, then I can choose from drive fault tolerance, which is RAID 5, or no fault tolerance, which is mirroring. So I'm gonna choose drive fault tolerance. So what I need to do next is select the individual drives and then I can start to include these drives in the RAID one by one. And when you've populated the RAID with enough drives, in this case you need three for RAID 5 at least, then it tells you that the RAID is configured and it gives you a black flag to say that you need to save the configuration before it becomes active. So now all I need to do is exit and if I choose OK, asks me if I want to save it and then gives me the option to reboot. So the RAID is now frantically building itself um, and as you saw in the post sequence, um, only one device is recognised now because as far as it's concerned, this is one storage device. And this whole process took about 20 minutes to build the entire RAID. Now that we have a storage device, we can install an operating system. Normally with a setup like this, I would have a separate hard drive for the operating system and then I would use the RAID separately for data storage. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. I haven't got space in the case for more than three drives anyway. So I'm just going to install the operating system and all the data on the RAID. This is just a silly bit of fun really. It's not mission critical or anything like that. I'm installing Windows NT 3.51, which massively outdates the CPU, which was from 1991. But the requirements of NT4 are much greater than NT 3.51, which is better suited to 486 and is also the minimum version I can use for internet information services. The install process requires three floppy disks, which I wrote from images that I downloaded from archive.org and a CD. Best of all, all the hardware installed in this computer is natively supported by drivers in the operating system. So I didn't have to mess about with extra driver disks. It just did the whole thing itself. So once that's installed, I'm going to log in for the first time. And for those of you that haven't seen NT 3.51 before, it's not that different from Windows 3.1 on the surface. So you've got the same kind of program groups, um, but if we look in the control panel, it is a bit different. So you've got stuff like the FTP server. Um, you've actually got animated cursors as well, which you didn't get in Windows 3.1. So uh, the, also the display options are much more akin to the Windows 95 display control panel than in Windows 3.1, which was built into the setup program. What was that? Oh my God, I've got a gay animated cursor. I can't believe it, this is amazing. You've got an administrative tools group and that has the same sort of programs in it for user management and management of services, etc. So now we're just going to skip to the installation of Back Office, which added a load of enhancements to Windows NT Server, such as Internet Information Services version 1 and SQL Server and things like that. So you've got different versions for the different architectures supported by Windows NT, which include Alpha and MIPS and PowerPC, but obviously we're installing the i386 version. So first you have to install the back office installer and then you can run the installer. And the first thing it's gonna do is upgrade whatever version of Windows NT you have to Windows NT Server. Now I've tried this loads of different ways, including installing NT Server to start with and installing back office later on, I just got into trouble with it. It caused issues and I didn't really know what was going on. So the way that worked for me was to install Windows NT Workstation and then let the back office installer upgrade it to NT Server and then I could install the extras that I wanted. And for those of you that like flashing lights and drive activity, this is what the drive controllers look like when it's installing from the CD.
Once the operating system is upgraded, you can see we've got all these options such as Exchange Server, Internet Information Services, and I'm just gonna stick with that and SQL Server. And that includes a Gopher service and an FTP server and a bunch of other useful stuff, which I'm not going to use, but which I'm going to install anyway. Ah, the sweet grating sound of three SCSI hard drives creating a database. I'll tell you what, these are getting quite hot though. Um, I'm going to need some kind of fan in this system, definitely. Right, now that's all configured and working, and no more messing about needed, I can install all of this into the case. Actually, there's one more thing that I want to try. I want to test the fault tolerance of the RAID. And there's an easy way to do that because so I've got drive one, drive two, drive four. I'm going to give that the ID three instead. What I've done is I changed it to three. The RAID card went nuts. And it's got this really annoying alarm. I mean, it's not going off now because I went into the utility, but it's the most high pitched alarm I've ever heard. unbearable um, I can change the drive to 3 it thinks that drive 4 is missing from the raid and then it will find drive 3 and I should be able to rebuild it so let's see if that's going to work there is a version of DPT storage manager for Windows NT which unfortunately I haven't been able to get to work so I'm using the DOS version instead and once we load that up it shows us that there is a separate drive which it doesn't recognize and that one of the drives in the existing RAID is faulty and at this point we can tell the program that drive 3 is a hot spare and then we can tell the RAID to rebuild, save the changes and reboot. It is worth saying at this point because two of the three drives are still functioning I could boot Windows and everything would still be there and working fine if I wanted to. And ideally, I would have had an extra drive installed already, set up as a hot spare so that it would fail over straight away. And once I go back into the program, it tells me that drive four is now no longer part of the RAID and drive three is. Well, here's just a quick recap of the stuff that's going in here into this case, which is pretty spacious and not dissimilar to the one specified in the swan db manual as one of the cases uh, the other one was like a big tower obviously i don't have one of those so we've got the adaptex scuzzy card which is going to do floppy and cd a 3com ethlink 3 because it has inbuilt os support and i don't have an ESA network card a serial card et4000 the dpt raid card which actually, although it says it's a PT 2021, it's actually a Smart Cache 3. Uh, that's what the product was named when it had all the bits attached to it already. I tried to boot this card uh, bare and it just wouldn't have it. So I guess uh, the ROMs have been upgraded to support the upgrades. The three SCSI hard drives and our four speed SCSI Toshiba CD ROM drive the motherboard luckily the modification to the rtc chip does not affect any of the cards going in there uh, neither does the uh, passively called cpu and i'm going with the dx50 because that is a business class cpu and this is a business class machine of course uh, floppy drive three and a half inch no space for five and a quarter inches here i'm afraid and the psu i nearly forgot something which is where are the drives going to go well, one of them will have to go in this cage, uh, which is where the main hard drive would have been anyway. And then we have this bay, which is three five and a quarter inch bays. Originally, there was a five and a quarter inch floppy drive, which was mounted with these rails. Now, these rails don't exist anymore. Of course they don't. They just got thrown away or whatever. So luckily, I was able to 3D print some replacements. Uh, so all I've got to do is sync these brass inserts into the holes so they can be secured to the side of the case. And then I've got these brackets, which I've had lying around four years and never needed. 
now I need them. See, keep hold of your stuff, people. It's not bad. It's you know, there's a lot of stigma attached to it, and I think you should feel fine about keeping things that you might need one day because I need these, and I've got just the right amount. Two pairs, so we're going to have CD-ROM drive at the top and two of the SCSI drives down here. All right, hopefully this works. Lee Smith, I'm blaming you if it doesn't. Oh, my solder tip's not big enough. Shit. Right, I've got the fat one now. Let's try that again. Nice. I can't believe it actually worked. It's beautiful. It lines up and everything. Amazing. Well, it's done. Annoyingly, I had to swap the positions of the DPT card and the Adaptec card because the power switch prevents me from having a full length bracket at the end here. So that means I've got to go into the ESA configuration and fix that. But otherwise, the cables aren't too messy. It is what it is. Just make sure that I've plugged in all of the buttons and the LEDs correctly, and then it will be finished. Well, now that's all back together, I thankfully have my desk back. So it's time to start phase two of this project, which is to make this a useful computer. Internet Information Services version one includes quite an extensive sample site with it that shows off the various technologies it can combine with. And one of those is SQL Server. So we just need to enable that service and the built-in documentation tells you exactly how to set it up so that you can configure the built-in guestbook and such. And that's what I've done. So all you need to do is go to the following web address, which is 486dx.ddns.net. And you will be able to browse the website that is hosted on this computer that I have built. So I'm just gonna show you that on here, IIS1 comes with version one of Internet Explorer, which has its own holding page. Then I can browse to the local website, which gives you this. As you can see, it has this absolutely repulsive and amazing sample website from 1994. You've got your garish colors, your dodgy fonts, your background texture, it's got everything. Well, there we go. Not my usual gaming based video. Uh, hopefully no one else has done a web server on a 486 with RAID. Uh, if they have, I'd be surprised, but not disappointed uh, because I would say the 486, certainly Socket 3 is one of my favorite platforms. It's really versatile. It's got a great history, lots of competition, and I'm looking forward to making lots more videos about it in the future. So I'm hoping to keep the web server online for the month of September, if all goes well. If things don't go so well, then I might have to take it offline. Um, and it is running on a 50 megahertz computer. So if you do have trouble getting connected, try again another time. I would love to see your comments in the guest book. And it would also be great to see you on Twitter as well. So make sure you check out the other videos for the 486 build-off. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you later.